Merry Christmas, everybody. You guys ready to have church? We're going to start up. Instead of our regular intro video, I've got a new intro video uh, for you guys. So check this out. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, then the band, the uh, Nitty Gritty Church Band, will take it from there. Merry Christmas. Well, welcome everybody to a Christmas edition of uh, the Water and Hole Church, Salvation Saloon. We are so happy to see everybody here. You guys look great. You guys look like you're ready to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Are you? <laughs> well, we're going to have fun today. We're just going to be a little bit laid back. We're missing Bear, but we got Annie up here with us instead. Yay! Yay! So we're going to have a lot of fun. Just doing some good Christmas songs and being, getting ourselves in the right state of mind to celebrate, uh, celebrate Christmas. So we hope that you're here and you'll join in with us as we go through this.
I got something stuck in my throat, and I think it's my tongue. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, again, we are so happy you're here to celebrate this Christmas service with us, and uh, this is a standard that we've done every Christmas, this particular song, ever since I, I've been here. So I hope you'll enjoy it. tell you something this <laughs> thank you praise god <laughs> <laughs> praise are you god. sure you want to sit all the way up front <laughs> i'm just wondering there's, a, there's probably some other seats back <laughs> hey he's giving us he's giving us a compliment we really need it <laughs> yeah we need them <laughs> yeah. all right listen this song this is kind of a it's, uh, there's an interesting story, at least for me, about this particular song because, um, you know how we, I, you know, we have our memories from when we were very little, and usually they're a bit fragmented, but I have a very strong memory. I mean, a really, a, a memory that I mean, I can see it in my mind all the time, and it's probably from when I was about four or five, and uh, I know it was that because uh, we were still living in Ranger, Texas next door to my grandmother, and uh, it involves this song because I remember being in Bible, Bible school, uh, and we, w we were being taught this song because we were going to sing it for the congregation after Bible school, and uh, my grandmother was our teacher, so she was teaching us this particular song, so it kind of has this, this place in my mind that will never go away because it's just just a strong, very strong memory of when I was a little boy. And uh, 
And here I am, a grown-up, singing the same song for the congregation. We've come a long way, baby. We're singing it in a bar, you know, on Christmas. <laughs> no, anyhow. <laughs> few songs here really would like your help because I'll tell you what we can use it <laughs> first of all <laughs> but these are all songs that you know all right and this is the time to sing out and just tell God how thankful we are through these songs for what he's done for us on this particular day All right, thank you, band. All right, well, Merry Christmas. And uh, welcome to our Christmas service here at the Salvation Saloon. 
this is obviously a big day for us or a big day for, for the Christian faith because this is the day that it all began. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is the day that it all began, the birth of a Savior. Savior, that was God's gift to man. And uh, that's exactly what the Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, when it says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, to those of you who just may be here for the first time, I uh, just want you to know that it is our prayer that you'll all feel welcome and that you'll all be blessed. And uh, we just want you to know that uh, as our guest from here on out, all you guys got to do is just sit back, hang on, enjoy the ride. Um, but as for the rest of us, our church family, uh, as always, we like to make sure that we do recognize each other. And I know this is a different kind of day, but we still want to do that. And uh, I think we got a special birthday here, don't we, Rob? Oh, there it is. Hey! Come on! Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, hey, you know what? I think we forgot one, didn't we? Oh, yes! Hey! Come on! Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. All right, that's who it's all about today, amen? All right, well, we've got a, a lot going on today, and uh, so let's get right at it. Um, let's all bow our heads and let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for being a God who so loved the world that you sent us your son, Jesus, who came to save us and give us eternal life. And as we acknowledge that today, Lord, we ask that you bless us and encourage us with your presence. And now as we uh, take up this offering uh, and offer our gifts to you in support of this ministry, Lord, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver, and we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. And now, let's all worship our God together as we join the Nitty Gritty Church Band uh, and sing this familiar Christmas song. This is one of those Christmas songs that... You know, it's been around. I looked up this um, in history this uh, this week. This was written in, in 1745. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was a young boy, though. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and it comes from. Uh, um, it has its roots in classical music. This, this beginning of this is actually from a classical music uh, composer. But uh, I know that you know it, so you have no excuse for not singing along with us. Because it is absolutely a glorious, uh, a glorious song. You ready? We're all doing this one together. Woo, yes. Joy to the world. Sounding joy, repeat the sounding 
All right. Good to see all the seats filled. No, that's not what I want. Go to the sermon. This first slide. First slide. Hold on, I gotta sit down and I gotta get down. Oh, there we go. All right, Rob. You're a week ahead. <laughs> All right. If you're here for the first time, this is how it goes every week, I'm telling you. Oh, God love us. All right, man. Okay. Here we are. It's another Christmas. And, uh, man, Christmas is such a special time. Uh, for all of us, right? because Christmas is this worldwide holiday that has given us all just so many great memories. Uh, of course, there's the gifts, right, because that's what Christmas is all about, right? It's about giving, and uh, that's a tradition that was actually started with the very first Christmas because Jesus was God's gift to man. Amen? Amen. Unfortunately, though, in our world today, commercial success has become more important than the spirit spiritual success of that God-given tradition. And so here we are. Jesus has now been removed from the forefront, and the appropriate greeting for the season is Happy Holiday and not Merry Christmas. And you know what? That's just wrong. That's just wrong. Now, that's not to say that Sue and I haven't enjoyed playing up, you know, all the, uh, the Santa stuff with our kids and, and, and now with our grandkids. But although that has created a whole lot of fun and a lot of great memories, Man, it still cannot replace the real reason for the season, and that is the birth of Jesus Christ. Because as believers, that's where it all began for us. It's where it all began. And so if we are not playing up that story with our children, and even more than, than all the Santa stuff, then we are certainly providing a disservice to our faith. Because the birth of Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, is one of the very foundations of our faith. Amen? All right. Now, I know you guys know, we all know the basic story, um, but really there's, there's more to it uh, than that. And so what I thought we would do today is I thought it would be a good idea to maybe um, take a slightly uh, more in-depth look at the Christmas story. And so let's do that, and let's do that by way of the book of Matthew, where in verse 18 of chapter 1, the story begins by saying, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Now, for those of you who may be here and, and you do not have a deep understanding of the Bible, uh, the first thing that you need to know is that the Bible I is a historical book, right? And that is actually where the Christian faith is different from philosophy and, and spirituality because our faith is based on actual history. Now, also, Christianity, Christianity is different from other religions uh, in the fact that other religions teach that we're to save ourselves, right? And primarily by following certain rules and living a good life, right? Lives uh, where hopefully our good will, will outweigh our bad. But that's not the case in Christianity. Because in Christianity, it is not about what we can do for God, but it's about what God has done for us. And that all begins right here with the birth of a baby named Jesus, Right, whose name appropriately means the God who is our Savior. The God who is our Savior. So here's the thing. This is more than just some nice story in a book. right? A, a nice story in a book about a baby who grew up to be a good man and, and then went on to do some good things. But this is, stor this is the story of a God who became a man. Right? It's the story of a promised Messiah that Scripture had foretold would come to save all mankind from their sins. And again, that's based on history, right? The history that is his story, his story, which, as it says here, came about when his mother Mary was pledged to be married to a guy named Joseph. Now, the way things worked back then is that marriages were prearranged, 
right? And so Mary and, and Joseph could have actually been engaged, I mean, way back when they were just a couple of years old. And, and then from there, um, when they reached the age of uh, maturity, which back then was probably in their early teens, well, that is when they would then enter into this uh, period that was called uh, uh, betrothal, right? And, and that's the period that we find Mary and Joseph in here. Uh, and that is a period of about, uh, of about a year. And, and during that time, what they would do is they would get to know each other um, prior to the actual wedding ceremony and the physical consummation that would then follow. Now, that probably sounds like, you know, being engaged today. A and it is. But there is one big exception, right? And that is a couple who were betrothed to, to each other back then, they were actually considered to be married, right? And as far as it would um, require a divorce to prevent the, the wedding from taking place. Now, that's important to understand because as we now continue, well, we're told this. We're told that before they came together, so before their wedding ceremony and, and the physical consummation that would follow, uh, well, it tells us this. tells us that she, Mary, was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And there it is right there, right? The virgin birth. Now, the virgin birth is vitally significant. Vitally significant. Because if Jesus was to qualify as a Savior, right, as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world... Well, just like the Old Testament sacrifices, right, where the lamb uh, had to be spotless and without blemish, well, so would a Savior need to be without blemish, right? And since all mankind inherits, uh, inherits that blemish sin nature, that is why Jesus had to be born through the Spirit and not through uh, a man, right? But here's the problem. Here, here's the problem at hand, and, and that is this. Uh, and that is that poor Joseph here, he hadn't been informed of all this, right? And so what do you suppose he's thinking uh, of Mary's sudden pregnancy? Well, what else could he think, right, other than that, that Mary had been unfaithful, right? And, and so we can just imagine, you know, the emotions that obviously consume this guy, right? Like the, the hurt of being betrayed by someone that you love, right? And the uh, the anger and the resentment that seems to just naturally follow that. But also, let's just think about poor Mary and how confused she must have been when she knew she had been faithful. So this story here, there's no doubt a whole lot of drama that was, was taking place. But uh, unlike the typical reaction, like what you might see on that Crazy Maury show, if you guys have seen that one, uh, unlike that show... In verse 19, here's how Joseph handled it. It tells us this. It says, Joseph, her husband, who was faithful to the law, not wanting to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Quietly. Now, the penalty for adultery, right, according to the law in Levit Leviticus chapter 20, was death. It was death. And it was a shameful death by way of a public stoning. But yet, as we see here, Joseph chose not to expose Mary to that faith. And um, that obviously tells us something about him. Amen? Uh, anyways, thank goodness uh, he uh, came to that decision because, as we're now told in verse 20, tells us this, tells that after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And continuing in verse 21, the angel then added that she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You'll give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And again, that's what that name means, right? It's a name that points towards his future mission as the promised Messiah and the Savior of the world. And in verse 22, it then tells us that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. All right. This would be talking about the prophet Isaiah, right, who actually some 700 years before the birth of Christ, I Isaiah said the Lord would give a sign. 
right? A sign that we, we now see quoted in verse 23. And that is this. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? Our God is with us. Now, in that verse in Isaiah, there, um, there are a few uh, actual Bible translations that do not say virgin there, right? But instead, what, what it says is it just says young maiden. And, and obviously, um, I mean, that would discredit the divinity of Jesus. Uh, but let's think about that uh, a little bit. Because when Isaiah said the Lord himself would give us a sign, man, what kind of a sign is it for a young maiden to give birth? Right? I mean, that, that happens thousands of times every single day. But when a virgin is having a baby, that's a sign. Amen? That's a sign. Now, again, to those of you who may not be real familiar with, with the Bible, um, the Bible consists of, of 66 books written by some 40 authors over a period of a, a few thousand years. And in the Old Testament, there were prophets, right? Prophets who gave specific predictions that were revealed to them by God regarding future events. And, and a large portion of those future events in the Old Testament to the prophets, they describe details of this, this coming Messiah. In fact, there were actually over 300 of them. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, every one of them played out in, in the life and death of Jesus, and they played out with undeniable accuracy. And so when it comes to the Bible, uh, there is just no other religious belief system that can even pretend to compare with the, the credibility of, of, of the Bible, of the Holy Bible. Anyways, here's Joseph. He now understands what's going on. And in verse 24, it says, When he woke up from his dream, uh, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife. And... Um, Man, just think how humbling that must have been, right? Because, you know, how, how humbling it was to be actually chosen to play a role in such an anticipated prophecy, right? Because this is what every Jew had been waiting for and longing for, right? And, and in verse 25, it then tells us this. tells us that he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and... Uh, as he was told, he gave him the name of Jesus, right? The God who came to be our Savior. Um, and again, that's different, right? That is different from all other religions because all other religions are about what we need to do to be able to exalt ourselves up to God. But only in the Bible is there a God who actually humbles himself down to us. And so, I mean, the more you dig into this, the, the, the Holy Bible, into God's Word, I mean, the more unique it, it really becomes. Anyways, now moving on to chapter 2. The story continues, continues in verse 1 by saying this. It says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, okay, which is, um, that was also a fulfillment of prophecy from the book of Micah, uh, where 800 years before the birth of Christ, uh, it declared that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And, and as the verse continues... Uh, it was during the time, this took place during the time of King Herod. During the time of King Herod, it tells us that Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. All right, who is this Magi? Well, this would be talking about those three famous wise men. Now, traditionally, uh, we say there were three because they gave three gifts. But actually, there was probably more of them than, than that. Um, but who are these dudes, right? Well, being from the east, it, it is likely that, that they were from Persia, which would be modern-day uh, Iran. And, and the reason that it's believed, uh, uh, we believe that is because the prophet Daniel had been there, and while he was there, he had specifically prophesied about the birth of Christ, right? Along with uh, another prophecy that also came from that very same area, and, and that was from a man named Balaam, who in the book of Numbers, he spoke of a star, that, that would rise out of Jacob, right? And since the Messiah was uh, to come from that ancestral line of, of Jacob, then that star was to believe to be associated with this, this coming Messiah. And uh, so that brings us to verse 2, 
When in Jerusalem, old King Herod asked the Magi this question. That is, he says, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And their answer is, we saw his star. We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. So there it is, the prophecy of his star, right? The star of Jacob being fulfilled. And um, now, when, when it comes to these magi, this magi, a whole lot that people really do not know about them. But I'm just going to go over a few things that we do know about them. And, and what we do know is that they obviously knew God's word, right? And we also know that they took that word, the word of God, to find the Messiah, and we know that they recognize his worth because as we're soon about to see, they're going to bring him some expensive gifts and, and they're going to worship him. But now we find that not everyone was quite as excited as them about the Messiah. Because in verse 3, it now tells us this. tells us that when King Herod heard this, it says that he was disturbed. Right? And he was disturbed because this king, he was not going to share his kingdom with another king. Now, history tells us this about old King Herod. It tells us that he was a very paranoid little, little guy, right? Um, uh, we also know that he killed three of his own sons when he thought that they were actually plotting against them, right? And, and there was even a, a famous saying back then that said that it was safer to be one of Herod's pigs than to be one of Herod's sons. So it tells you a little bit about him. Uh, anyways, what he did is Herod, uh, he also had scripture research. And he learned that the Messiah uh, was to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, and that prophecy from Micah that I just mentioned, well, it is now quoted in verse 6. And, and this, is, uh, this is the prophecy. Verse 6 says, But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so in verse 7 it says, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, that was um, about two years earlier, two years before. And then in verse 8, well, he then sends them to Bethlehem, and he, he said this to them. He said, go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, well, report back to me so that I, too, may go and worship him as well. Um, but we obviously know that was a big lie because it wasn't worship that old Herod had on his mind, but it was murder, right? Anyways, after uh, finally realizing that Herod was just playing them, the Magi, they never did uh, report back to him. Um, and so that is when Herod uh, had to go to uh, Plan B, and that's when he made a decree to kill all the male children in Bethlehem under the age of two, right? And under the age of two, because again, that is when that star first appeared. And um, so that tells us about him, tells us about how evil um, King Herod was. Uh, of course, we know as the story goes on, God then warned Joseph. Uh, he fled with Mary and Jesus to Egypt. Um, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. So anyways, in verse 9, after, he, uh, after they heard the king, they went on their way, Magi went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose and went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And in verse 11, it says this. It says, on coming to the house. All right, now notice it says house and not manger. And that's because unlike the traditional story, again, this was most likely a couple uh, of years after the birth of, of Jesus. And then it says this. It says, when, the, uh, when they saw the child with his mother Mary, they bowed down, and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, these three gifts are significant. And so beginning with gold, uh, I'll explain why. Um, gold is, is something that you gave to kings, right? And so here they're, they're recognizing Jesus as the king. Right, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then we have frankincense. Frankincense is a high quality incense, and, and it's very a aromatic. And uh, that uh, incense signifies how our prayers rise like a, a sweet aroma 
to, to God. And specifically here, we're talking about all those prayers that were made in anticipation uh, of the promised Messiah's arrival. And so it's actually here all those rising prayers were, were answered. And then, then there's myrrh. Now, that gift is a little strange, right? Because myrrh was used in preparation of dead bodies, right? It was actually like the embalming fluid of the day. And, and so that certainly wasn't something that you would be giving, uh, you, you'd give to, uh, uh, as a gift to a, to a child. But we know it was significant to Jesus, right? Because death signified his mission. A mission to pay a debt he didn't know because we all had a debt we couldn't pay. And again, that's God's gift to man. That was God's gift to man. Because just as it said in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that, that is the Christmas story. That is the Christmas story. A story from Scripture and prophecy that was introduced into history itself, which for us today is his story. And his story, it's the greatest story ever told. Greatest story ever told. And that is the reason for this season. Amen? Amen. All right. And now, well, what better way to acknowledge God's gift to mankind and and the great love that, that was behind it all, then as a family at this very uh, special, on this very special day, to partake in the Lord's Supper together. Sound good? All right, well, let's do that. Guys, all have your stuff? Your bread and your wine? All right. Well, again, it all began at that very first Christmas 2,000 years ago when a Savior named Jesus was born. But as I just mentioned, he was born to die because his future death was the mission of his life as he came to willingly suffer and die in our place so that we could receive salvation and living eternally in the presence of God. And that is why, that is why Jesus took his beaten and battered body all the way to Calvary, and that was the greatest demonstration of love that this world has ever known. And so now, in preparation to receive the Lord's Supper, well, let's all accept God's love with a simple prayer and a humble heart. So let's all bow our heads, and let's repeat this prayer together. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. So from this point on, I want to rely on you. So I accept your gift of love by accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So please forgive me. Make all things new. As I will now... Seek to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So in remembrance of Christ, let us take the bread, which represents his body that was broken for us.
And now let us take the wine, which represents his blood that was shed for our sins. Oh, yes. We praise you, Father, for the gift of your son. Amen, people. All right. And now, I love you all. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And again, not a happy holiday, but a Merry Christmas. All right. And here's Jason to close. Good morning. It's good to see a full house. I like this. It's good. And Merry Christmas. I uh, I got announcements today. We uh, saved it for me. So next Sunday after the service, uh, we have a end of year, New Year Christmas gathering at uh, Colleen's house. There's papers on the back. If you have any questions, just grab someone and ask them. Uh, we can answer questions too. Uh, hope to see everyone there. And next week also, Paul will continue his uh, sermon from last week. Last He's going through the book of Luke, so it's the second part of the end of the times sermon. It's, uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, I like communion. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The funny thing about this relationship we have with him is I don't have to tell him to remember me. Uh, <laughs> he has to keep reminding us. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic we have. Uh, I've heard a few times this week that people outside in the world saying, you know, Christmas, Christmas isn't when Jesus was born. Um, I kind of have a universal answer that I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. The day matters not to me. Um, what matters is I stop and remember him. This is the day I stop and recognize that me and my family are going to say, happy birthday, Jesus. Thank you for that incredible gift you gave us. Um, we, he gave us what we didn't even know we needed at the time. They thought they were fine without him, but uh, we needed him. Uh, let's go to the throne room, talk to the king. Heavenly Father, thank you for coming down and being our sacrificial lamb, for doing what we couldn't do without us, without you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here at the church and celebrate you, go over your word, go over your story, and learn more. We pray that your hand of protection is over everyone this week, over our country, over this world, over the nation of Israel. And we all stop and just take that moment throughout this Christmas season and say, what is this really about? You are the reason for the season, and I'll stop and just remember that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you are able to help clean up, that's fantastic. If not, have a wonderful Christmas. See you next week.